And hey, welcome Pastor Jeremy as he comes to bring the word today. So today, Bob, you're right. Transition is coming. And I really, I really know that in my heart, we're in preparation. We're in preparation for some things that are getting ready to happen. We're feeling the pressure of it. Um, because once it happens, it's going to happen. There's no going back after it happens. So you being in preparation now for it is getting you ready. Because when, when things happen, when the change comes, some of you all that have been in preparation for a very long time are going to be put in a position where you're going to have to step up your game. And today I'm going to explain some reasons why. So buckle your seatbelt today. Today is going to be a bumpy ride. Can I get an amen? amen? I'm going to make a comment, which is my title, Attracted to Jezebel. Attracted to Jezebel. Hmm. Now God is going to raise up a hungry generation. God is going to raise up a thirsty generation. Now listen what I'm fixing to tell you. I believe that the Lord is saying that this next generation is either going to run with us or they're going to replace us. That's what I believe He's telling me. Let that soak in. I don't care where you are in life. If you get replaced, that's not a good thing. You better think about what I just said. That's what I believe the Lord has been telling me. They're either going to run with us or they're going to replace us. Now I'm going to bring my text out of 1 Kings today, if you've brought your Bible. They're going to put it on the screen. 1 Kings chapter 16, I'm going to start at verse 29. And in the 38 years, 38 years of Asa, the king of Judah, began Ahab. Ahab the son of Omri to reign over Israel. And Ahab reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Verse 30. And Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Stop. That's a huge statement. Because there were some bad people that had come before him. And yet he was worse than all of them. That's a huge statement. Verse 30. And Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been some small thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Verse 32, And he made an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Now stop. Let me explain to you what I just read. Here is a man who has such wickedness in his heart that when he got ready to pick a wife, he was attracted to Jezebel. And Jezebel is such a nasty chick, and I do mean nasty, that she lives all the way to the book of Revelation. And by the time that we get to the book of Revelation, God is still rebuking the church over tolerating this nasty spirit called Jezebel. That means that she is alive and well today, is what that means. Most of the problems that we are dealing with today in the church are a direct cause of the spirit of Jezebel. She hates prophetic leadership. She hates it. She hates men of authority. 
that stand in a strong seat of confidence. She hates them. And you would be surprised of some of the traits of Jezebel that we are going to be getting into in the near future. And you would be surprised or even shocked at some of the traits that even us as people and believers are carrying that are not our traits. They're hers. And yet we justify it as personality when it's not. And we're going to be diving deeper into that in the near future. Jezebel hates men that believe in the Bible. And Jezebel doesn't necessarily have to be a woman either. She can operate in a man, her traits. Although primarily it operates in the life of a woman, especially one who does not have a legitimate biblical relationship with her husband. I said legitimate biblical relationship, not a religious one. I said a legitimate biblical relationship with her husband. Verse 33. And Ahab made a grove. A grove is a wooden image. Ahab made a wooden image, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the other kings that were before him. In his days did Hill build Jericho. Am I on the right page? Okay. Now it took a little shift here. Stay with me. And he laid the foundation thereof in Abram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now let me talk to you again. Stay with me. I want you to understand this. There's this man named Ahab that is so wicked that his personal wickedness caused him to have a perverted attraction. Who would look at Jezebel, the very spirit that is contrary to the ways of God, and say, I want to marry her? Who would do that? But see, the reason that he was attracted to her is because he failed to govern his own affections in other areas. So when it came time for him to pick a wife, he already had the perverted idea of what attractive was to him. To the point that he no longer could make righteous discernment about who he was supposed to marry. And I hate to say it, guys, but I have to say it. That's the dangers of pornography. I get it. I get it. I mean, we all know that pornography violates the ways of God and that it messes with your thinking. We already know that. But let me tell you what else it can do. It can cause you to misidentify what pretty is. It messes with your thinking because you're looking at some image of a woman that does not have the spirit of the living God on the inside of her being attracted to that can cause you to miss how attractive a woman is who is full of holiness. See, you missed the woman who has adorned herself in a righteous manner. See, you missed that. See, you missed the woman who doesn't have to spend all of her time trying to put it out there. Let all the men say amen. Amen. And for the women, for the women who don't have pornography problems, but sit around and watching desperate housewives, and end up marrying some guy that's got a wallet full of money and yet sleeping with two secretaries and his personal assistant, and you're wondering how in the world did this happen? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you missed the guy that was faithful to church with his hands lifted in the air that had something to offer that money couldn't buy. Now all you ugly guys in here ought to be you're just getting ready to start shouting. (laughs) 
I'd be shouting about now if I was you. Yeah, because you sitting there going, yeah, I ain't got no money, but I love Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes. That's right. Don't be marrying some dude because he's got on expensive blue jeans and a really nice car. You better find a man that prays. Listen, I'd be finding a man with a job. But I'd also make sure that he's got a Bible in his hand. And that he prays. And that he's submitted to authority. Oh, oh ladies, you just lost about 95% of your pickings out there, right there. To find you a man that's praying, got a Bible in his hand, and submitted to authority. And it wouldn't hurt that he loved his mama. Now, if you'd have chose that praying guy, then your purpose would have been to lay your life down to help him get there. And that results in purpose and brings fulfillment, which you don't have if you didn't. Sorry. Sorry. You want me to be honest with you? I try to listen to pastors around here. There's some good ones. I try to listen to them. They just want to talk about love in John 3.16. But what they don't do is they don't hold you accountable for the decisions you make that causes the ripple which needs to come to repentance. Repentance breaks the curses of your poor decisions. Well, how do you know to repent if ain't nobody telling you what your bad decisions were? Because we all make them. It's not a question that you're not going to make bad decisions. It's going to be, what are you going to do after you've done it? Now this dude Ahab, he had unrighteous affections. The sin that he would not deal with in his own heart made him attracted to things that he should have been repulsed by. You have to deal with it, my friends. You have to deal with it. You have to hate it. You've got to hate it. I mean, you have got to take it to the cross and you have got to say, God loves me and He loves me too dead gum much to not touch this area in my life. I want it gone. I don't care how long it takes, how hard I have to try, how many times i got to pray, how many times I've got to go to the altar, how many times i got to confess I want this gone and I'm going to pursue it leaving my life until God touches this area in my life. I do. I get tired of hearing some of the preaching. I try to listen to some people to get some good ideas. There's nothing wrong with that. There's some anointed men and women out there. I love to hear where God's at with people. But I do get tired of some of the people, you know, in, in, the, in the new modern church, wondering why we ain't seeing no miracles. Wondering why the divorce rate is just as high in the church as it is outside of the church. There are a lot of illegitimate pastors out there trying to pastor. Maybe I don't have the right to say this, but I think I do because of where I come from. I believe I've got a right to make this statement, and I don't think hardly anybody else does. So I'm going to make it. I grew up in this. There are a lot of illegitimate pastors out there trying to pastor, and when I say illegitimate, it's because they have no apostolic covering over their life. See, they had a call on their life, yes. They did. But they got so tired of serving in the place that they were serving under apostolic leadership that the power struggle got so intense that they aborted the call to go pastor their own church. They loved the mantle more than they loved the man carrying it. Therefore, they are disqualified in carrying one. That's why I say illegitimate. They ain't supposed to be standing there. They aborted the call. 
Hey, don't be putting an expectation on the people to start repenting until leaders lead by example. Amen. You know, there's a greater sense of honor and loyalty in the hearts of many of those in the world than there is in those of us that claim to be redeemed and washed in the blood. Grow up and endure some hardship. Jesus, help us. Just because things don't go exactly the way you want them to go, man, you're going to have to tell yourself to work through this in a biblical manner and that I'm going to grow up because of this trial in my life, and that's good preaching. Anyway, Ahab, he made a wooden image. And Ahab did more to provoke God to anger than all the other kings of Israel that went before him. I want you to look at verse 34. In his days, whose days? Ahab's days. Did Heal, the Bethelite, build Jericho? He laid the foundation thereof in Abram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which was spoken by Joshua, the son of Nun. So what was spoken by Joshua? Well, let me tell you. What is he talking about? He's saying what Joshua had already prophesied. Joshua 6, 26. This is what Joshua said. This is after the walls of Jericho had come down. Cursed. Here it is again. Cursed. Cursed be the man before the Lord who raises up and builds the city of Jericho because he will lay his foundation with his firstborn and with his youngest shall he put up his gates. Did you even catch that? He'll rebuilt Jericho knowing that it was going to cost the lives of the next generation. Who would build something that they knew was going to cost the life of their firstborn and cost the life of their youngest? Who would do that? Because Joshua said that that's what was going to happen before he did it. Are you following me? And he did it anyway. Who would do that unless you're under the government of perversion? Are you all sweating yet? Listen, you have got to be careful who you are joined to. You better be careful who you are joined to. You better be real careful who your headship is going to be. Just going to be plain with you. You better find leadership with a good marriage. And not just look for a leadership with a good pulpit. So you ought to find leadership whose children have been raised in such a way that it's the way God identifies a rich man. Not the world. You need to connect with people who do the family thing according to the Bible. Because I believe that the greatest revival will be a revival of God's intention for the family. The attack we're going through as a nation right now, whether it be through the homosexuality, whether it be through abortion, school systems, transgender, taxes, health care, it doesn't matter. It's all an attack on the family. All of it. And families today, for whatever reason, they think that just because they get together for activities, that that means that they're in harmony. What a joke. What a joke. You ain't in harmony. That ain't nothing to do with harmony. God has an idea for families and He is looking for, for a leader that when you get under His umbrella, it will have a huge impact on you and your family. Listen, never build anything that's going to cost you the lives of your children. 
This new modern title that says you can do whatever you want that makes you feel good is costing us a generation. Daddy staying up late watching things he ain't supposed to be watching. It's going to affect your children. Living in a house that has no prayer or in a house that has no harmony in it between the mother and the father or living in a house where you don't honor God and give the first fruits of your increase is going to have a huge impact on the next generation. Listen, I I know that I don't ever want my kids to hear me preaching something that I'm not already living at home. I don't ever want my kids to look at me and see hypocrisy. I want them to know that I am the same on Friday night as I am on Sunday morning. Listen to me, fathers. Your selfish decisions that are made after the desires of your flesh have an impact on your children whether you want to admit it or not. The sexual perversion that we are experiencing in the world today is a consequence of fatherlessness. I didn't say a lack of dads. You can be a dad all you want. That has nothing to do with being a father. The heart of a father is not the same thing as being a dad. I mean, we can't just tear Romans 1 out of the Bible because of your, your affections are all perverted. We need fathers that will rise up and provide the kind of home for their children where they know what a real man of God is supposed to look like. So what is the answer? What is the answer for a generation that is under the governmental perversion of sin that builds things that are going to cost us our kids? I mean, this ain't just an issue in the world. This is an issue in the church as well. Because churches do not talk about repentance. They don't talk about it properly anyway. And because they don't, it's going to cost us a generation. Like I said earlier, leaders better start leading by example instead of putting a demand on people to do what they won't do. Just going to say it. People are building churches out of the compromise of what's going to fill up the building instead of what God's Word said is going to cost us the next generation. We're going to have a generation that the only thing they know about church is that it's entertaining. They're not going to have any idea that the church is supposed to be a place where you come and you build an altar and have a meeting with God and turn your life around. Is anybody even hearing what I'm saying? We have a generation growing up that thinks that a Church is nothing more than a coffee and donut 30-minute Jesus instead of an everyday lifestyle. They don't even like your church unless you have cool songs and trendy clothes and funny entertaining sermons. It is the Word of the living God that has the power to change the life of a person. And somebody has got to get back to start preaching it. Instead of entertaining the crowd because we need to fill the seats. So what is the answer to this mess with Ahab? And fathers that build things that cost them the lives of their kids. I'm going to read verse 34 again. In his days, Ahab's days, Hill built Jericho. He laid its foundations with his firstborn, and he set up the gates with his youngest. According to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. So what is the answer? God has an answer, and it's in the very next verse. Oh, that's right. There is no next verse in that chapter. So we have to go to the next chapter. See, when the Bible was originally translated, it was just one long thing. 
They had to break it apart into chapters and verses so that we could find where we were going. So check this out. It should have read like this. Verse 34, again. In his days, Hill of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation with Abiram, his firstborn, and with his youngest son, Sigub. He set up its gates according to the word of the Lord, which has been spoken by Joshua. Chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah. The Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years unless it's by my word. Well, who is this Elijah? Who's Elijah? Malachi 4 5 tells us who he is. Malachi 4 5, who is it? It tells us, Behold! I will send you Elijah, the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. That's who Elijah is. What is the answer? It's a voice. It's a voice that will cause the hearts of the fathers to turn to the children and the hearts of the children to be turned to the fathers. And I pray that God will give us a thousand of them. And I'm, I want to be sure that He gives us the ones that nobody else wants. I'm talking about the ones that are full of tattoos, got hoops in their ears so big that animals can jump through them. Wearing pants so tight that when they bend over, their cell phone pops out and hits somebody in the head. That's who I want. Give us a thousand that come in broken and addicted and fatherless and orphaned and make them into the greatest movement the world has ever seen. I'm talking about the ones that where people see dry bones, you will see an army. Man, I hear the sound of rattling bones of the generations coming together. I'm going to stop right there. Take a deep breath. Do you see where things are heading? Did you know that you don't have the power to turn your heart to children no more than they have the power to turn their heart to you? What do you think this last big outpouring and awakening is going to be about when the spirit of Elijah is poured out upon God's people and the hearts of the fathers are going to turn to their children and the hearts of the children are going to turn to their fathers? And for those of you that have been in preparation for that, see... The people that just get to walk into that are going to have a blessing. They're going to get blessed. But the people that have been in preparation, like many of you, are going to get rewarded. And that's different. 